Okay, 12.15 on the dot. I was uh, anxiously awaiting that minute to count down. Uh, so I just uh, popped the live captioning link for this particular section in the chat. So that is up and available for anyone who needs it. Uh, in any case, can everyone hear me all right? I'm also waiting in chat too. All right, great. So. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, welcome to the official first day of the 2022 International Online Evergreen Conference. My name is Gina. I am the chair of the conference planning committee. And uh, before we head over to the keynote, uh, just going to give a welcome message with a bit of disclaimer. Um, last year, we typically, well, last year, at least we had um, a notice from the Evergreen Project Board, but we're actually gonna be um, doing that for the closing statement on Thursday. So um, if you are interested in that, just uh, make sure that you uh, reserve that time. Uh, but in any case, let's just move on with this welcoming message here. So we have a wonderful keynote that is um, all lined up for you after this uh, welcome message. So please stick around for that as well. And uh, let's get started with a special thanks to the Conference Planning Committee uh, everybody has been absolutely great in getting this conference off the ground. We are starting a bit later than usual. Typically, we try to do this in May. Uh, and I will admit that it was a bit of a scramble to get things uh, ready for June. But hey, we're here and um, we're really excited to have all of you join us. Uh, have a great schedule lined up. And again, uh, all thanks to uh, our planning committee presenters, attendees and sponsors. Uh, but special thanks to the planning committee first. So thanks to Ruth. Jennifer, Amy, Debbie, Rogan, and Katie. Uh, we also have two moderators who have uh, graciously um, volunteered last minute. So special thank you to Elizabeth and Catherine for those two. You might see them in some of the presentations that you'll see today. Uh, so it's been uh, quite a time um, just getting used to being someone who was on the committee last year doing some uh, smaller roles like moderating, et cetera. Now, um, being a chair of the committee. So I, I like to especially thank everybody for helping me get on board with us and up to date and on track. So let's uh, talk about our sponsors. Our platform sponsor for Hopin that we're using right now is uh, thanks to Equinox. So thank you very much for that. The captioning sponsor is also the Emerald Data. Uh, these are our champion sponsors. Uh, overall, we have a, a great amount of sponsors this year. So um, special thanks to everybody, uh, especially for Equinox and Emerald for the platform and captioning. For advocate sponsors, we have ECDI or the Evergreen Community Development Initiative that sponsored our pre-conference. So if you attended yesterday, uh, special thanks to ECDI for sponsoring that. Our keynote, which we'll we be uh, enjoying a little bit later on, is sponsored by Pales and Spark in association with Spark. So thank you for sponsoring our keynote. More advocate sponsors we have are Midwest Tape in association with Hoopla, uh, Kuipu, and CoolCat, the Consortium of Ohio Libraries. And finally, for our ally sponsors, we have Bibliomation, Unique, Mark I think, MeScan, Stack Courier, and CW Mars. Thank you uh, for all the sponsors, ally, champion, and advocate uh, for just being so great and uh, helping us get this conference together. Uh, they will be um, over at the exhibitors uh, hall which is in the expo portion of hopin so please pop in and talk to them about that uh, but we'll go ahead and go with our uh, platform and schedule notes including the exhibitor times so uh, if you have not used hopin uh, welcome to the platform it's a all-inclusive uh, into one browser type of conferencing software so uh, all of our sessions, like the one that you're in now for the keynote, are going to be um, sessions and in rooms. So uh, the majority of our presentations will be done through tracks one and two. If you're looking for the schedule and also the program details, that's in the reception area. So we have links to our website there. So please take a look at reception uh, to get that information. Lightning talks and breakout spaces are also put into separate rooms and or sessions uh, within Hopin as well. So um, we do have signups for lightning talks uh, that are available. I will post a link for that in the chat um, as soon as we uh, finish up this portion of the welcome. Uh, but we do have some signups available for that. That will be uh, today and Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time or 12 p.m. Pacific time. And the breakout sessions are some really nice sessions you could go into and just chat um, with other people. So if you need a break, head over there as well. 
the exhibitor times are going to be today through Thursday from 12 p.m. Uh, to 4 p.m. Eastern time and 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, please pop in when you can, especially during breaks and talk to the exhibitors too. Uh, we have some really uh, friendly faces who are there willing to um, take some time out of their day to talk to us. And they are totally uh, excited to see some people pop in as well. Uh, we do have an online social hour at Wednesday tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 3 p.m. at Pacific time. That's a really good way to get to know the community. Uh, we usually play some Jackbox games and uh, it's, a, it's a fun thing for everybody to be a part of. And also Hackfist is on Friday. So this is a free event. It's a really good way to cap off the conference week. It's a good time to come in and talk about projects, uh, documentation topics, development topics, systems, et cetera. And there is an authority fest uh, for all of you uh, acquisitions and cataloging people out there, that's going to be at 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern time, 8 a.m. or 10 a.m. Pacific time. So recording and captioning, most of the sessions will be recorded, like the keynote pre-conference presentations from yesterday, the regular presentations for the conference today, lightning talks, and the closing statement. Uh, recordings will become publicly available on the Evergreen YouTube Following the conference and the slides um, and other visuals that have accompanied the presentations will be posted to the program's description page of the conference website after conference as well. And most events will be live captions. Uh, we will have moderators and the captioners post the link in the sessions chat throughout the presentation when that becomes available. Interest groups, social events, hack fest, and discussion rooms will not be recorded or captioned. So just keep mindful of that. We do have a code of conduct and video photo policy. So if you go to this website, evergreen-ilis.org code of conduct, it's also linked onto our conference website as well. Um, all the information is there on uh, participant and uh, uh, presenters. It's also going to apply to exhibitors as well uh, throughout all the conference events or spaces, no matter where it's going to be. That's the code of conduct that we'll be using. Um, if you also go to the Code of Conduct Responders uh, website, that's also going to include a form. So if there's any incidents or bad actors that are happening, you want to report to us, uh, please submit that in the form as soon as possible. And we also have our photography policy that's posted on um, the website as well. So just a quick reminders from that to take from it. Uh, cameras are always optional. You don't always have to have your camera on, whether you're presenting or even being in a breakout session. A alternate Screen name, avatar, photo is also okay within the bounds of the code of conduct. And also be mindful of your screen sharing. You don't want uh, to share any chat rooms or windows that you don't want others seeing. Uh, what's nice about Hopin is that you could actually say, uh, sorry, uh, share specific tabs too. So just be mindful that those options are available to you if you have to share. Uh, we also have uh, some social media going on too. So we really encourage everybody to be a part of that. Uh, the hashtag for this will be EVG ILS 22. We also have a Twitter account on Evergreen ILS or on Facebook. And I also uh, included the link to the YouTube so you could be um, aware of all the things that are coming up on there. Uh, we also have a previous conference presentations that are posted there. And of course, uh, this conference presentation for this year is going to be posted there as well. So the theme for this year is shaping the future. And we also like to thank very specially to our presenters and attendees. Everything, especially being part of an open source community, you know that a lot of things are voluntarily run. So thank you for volunteering your time for presenting and thank you for also attending too. We wouldn't have made this possible without you. So I think that's it for me. Uh, and now I'm going to have Katie introduce her keynote whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Gina, and also a big thanks uh, to Gina for taking on chairing the community, uh, the committee for the conference this year. She was delightful to work with, and um, I know that we're going to have a great time this week. I did want to also mention um, that Mobius is another champion sponsor. We had so many sponsors this year. It was fantastic. And we here at the Pale Spark Consortium in Pennsylvania are thrilled to be sponsoring our keynote speaker, Vitika. She comes to us from GitLab and she is someone who spent a lot of time talking about and thinking and working with uh, UI and UX design, especially in open source. Um, and she also does some game design products, which I love. 
And uh, she also has uh, her uh, GitLab page and her Twitter page are linked from the uh, conference keynote speaker page. And so definitely check her out on those platforms. And thank you, I see Gina is also sharing our uh, Twitter has hashtags for the event. So definitely tweet along if you feel like it. And without further ado, I bring you, it takes a community to design an experience. Thank you so much, Katie, for the introduction. I will quickly, yes, it is working fine. That's great. So hello, everyone. And I would just like to add a little to uh, everything that Katie just mentioned. So yeah, I am a product designer at GitLab and currently I'm based out of Toronto and English is one of the four languages I speak. So please bear with me through the course of this talk. Um, and just to put a little context to um, how I landed uh, at GitLab. So before GitLab, I was at Red Hat and that kind of marked my debut in the developer experience space and the open source arena. And that about uh, something that I just want to state before I get started with uh, delivering the content is the perspective that I'm about to share in content to follow is that of a product designer. But I want to emphasize that even though there are experienced designers and product designers uh, roles uh, that we see in everyday uh, interactions and their primary job is to craft and design experience. In my opinion, each one of us does that at some level in some capacity in our everyday lives. So each one of us is working towards putting together some part of an experience in whatever role we are playing in society. And with that, I, I jump right into the topic. Okay, um, yeah. So psychologists say that after a long day of making decisions for ourselves, the quality of our choices get negatively affected by a phenomenon called decision fatigue. But this effect, it magically goes away when we are making decision for others. I and mean, you would see that uh, it is very easy to give advice to others than making decisions for yourself. It, sometimes it is even enjoyable to give others uh, feedbacks and advices about their life. That's how much we love deciding for others. Our brain understands that we are not going to be affected by the consequences directly. So it thinks like, why not? But most of us here being adults, we don't appreciate someone else making decisions for us. Deciding things we can use, not use, or have access to, or not have access to. We like control over our own life. So when we purchase a tangible good, we want to be sure that the commodity is to our liking. We sometimes get even cynical about the color, texture, fit, environmental impact, etc. when it is about a tangible good. We pay attention to every little detail that our eyes can perceive. However, oftentimes our judgment is not accounted for. We don't always get to make decisions. We don't get to choose the remote that comes with our television. We don't choose the console that dispenses our subway tickets. We don't choose the settings that come applied as defaults in our smartphones, computers, and tablets. We have no choice but to assume good faith there. And when things don't work out, sometimes we just have to live with it. Now let's talk about alternative possibilities a little. So the concept says that a person is morally responsible for what she has done only if she could have done otherwise. Now, loosely translated in layperson terms, it means that a person is only as guilty of doing something wrong as long as they're aware that there could be a better way of doing that. Now, I want to relate this philosophy to experience design practices uh, which are being used today. There's so many products that we use, tangible or digital, that come with its own user experience. In fact, everything comes with its own user experience, so scratch that. Now, when we adopt or purchase any product, we assume that the decisions that were made by the designers uh, were done in good faith and to our benefit, which it perhaps was. But what we also need to take into consideration is that there's always a limited number of humans working on designing the experience for a given product, especially in a non-open source setup. 
and a human brain has limitations of its own. Now, for example, when we say the user base of a product or service expands, now what we mean is that so does the representation of people belonging to higher number of ethnicities, income group, cultural background, geographical locations, etc. Now, as all of these factors expand, so does the area of unknowns. Now, do we really expect a team of five designers to design an experience for a digital product that has, let's say, a user base across 10 countries with age group ranging between 12 to 50 years? But that is exactly how most companies today operate. So if you still think that that application you are using right now, maybe as I'm speaking, um, has been tailored to your requirement, then be prepared to be surprised for the very same and obvious reasons. There is a very less chance that the person claiming to be designing for you understands you. All of us have our own versions of stories where a bunch of people sitting in an idea room in a class building, somewhere in San Francisco, Seattle, Bangalore, or Singapore has made decisions for us. They might not be holding Ill intentions while doing so, but as humans, we often overestimate our ability to understand human behavior, and that is not new. The foundation of user experience as a discipline is to question those assumptions, and yet that's what most of us find ourselves doing, the exact opposite. Now, today I want to share with you some examples that stand out of instances uh, when someone designed a tool or feature, assuming it would benefit users, but what it really ended up doing was the exact opposite. Now, in 2015, a new surfaced about a Chrome extension, Marauder's Map. Now, there's a Harry Potter connotation to that, but uh, since that doesn't fit the context, so I would just skip that. Now, that Chrome extension, Marauder's Map, that had been using the data from Facebook Messenger to locate users real time with an accuracy of, of up to a few meters. The extension exploited Facebook's default location settings that came enabled on both the Android as well as the iOS apps. Now this incident exposed a major flaw in the default permissions for Messenger. There would have definitely been a consensus in the design team, uh, I mean, given my own experience working on such products. Um, and they would have be, been very convinced themselves that they are going to provide some value to their users. Little did they had imagined that someone would be using it to stalk people using this exact capability. Another very recent and similar example uh, is that of Apple AirTags. Now, air tags are these adorable little tags that you put on any items that you fear uh, you might lose or go missing, or you just want to keep a track of. Utility-wise, it's an amazing thing, and especially for someone like me who keeps misplacing items, I really count on that. And from early this year, uh, there were incidents reported around this piece of technology being misused by people with ill intentions, looking to follow other people, Stalking. Now, stalkers would put air tags on their target's vehicle or other belongings and would receive complete information of their movements. Now, the way these air tags used to work was first of all, only iPhone users would be alerted about the presence of tag around them if somebody has maybe uh, dropped their own tag in their bag, let's say. And the frequency of alert that was uh, generated was also not ideal at first. And those were the caveats that were exploited. Now, the series of incidents compelled Apple to come up with an update in how they handle tracking using the device. They also put across this message saying um, ATAG is designed to discourage unwanted tracking. And if someone else's uh, ATAG finds its way into your stuff, your phone will notice it traveling. Uh, and it would also like sound some, uh, play some sound so that you get alerted that something is there, uh, something is around you. Now, after some damage had been done, uh, Apple took a good step uh, to make a few corrections, and that's worth some appreciation. But the problem is the damage is the damage in some cases, uh, it would translate into people losing their lives. I mean, that's the gravity of it. Now, talking about a use case um, from my own country, India. Indian government rolled out 
UIDAI in uh, 2010. This stands for Unique Identity Authority of India, if I'm not wrong. Um, but anyway, it goes, uh, the identity goes by the name Aadhaar. Now, what is Aadhaar? Aadhaar number is a 12-digit random number issued by the authority to the residents of uh, India after satisfying the verification process laid down by the authority. Now, any individual, irrespective of age and gender, who is a resident of India, may voluntarily enroll to obtain an Aadhaar number. Well, the voluntarily part stands debatable, uh, but that's for another day another opportunity anyway. Uh, it was decided later as a blanket rule that the ration cards of individuals in the country would be linked to Aadhaar number. Now public welfare distribution was moved to a biometric based authentication under the pretext of stopping funneling of ration and corruption. India as we know is a huge country where you can actually feel the culture of lifestyle, weather, and even food changing every 100 kilometers, and sometimes even less. There are geopolitical issues and pertinent issues tied to caste, gender, and socioeconomic privileges, like everywhere else. Now, coming up with a blanket rule that applies to every citizen in the country was a wrongly estimated and very ambitious move. There were instances where people didn't have means to go to the designated offices to get their UID number generated, and those who managed to get it faced other kind of challenges, such as their fingerprints getting changed due to heavy laborious jobs, retina getting damaged due to eye-related injuries, resulting into their biometric information getting altered. And this resulted into people dying of hunger because they couldn't get access to food which they otherwise could not afford to buy. The reason was simple. The team responsible relied heavily on locally generated assumptions and hypotheses, and they failed to take into consideration factors such as access to mobile connectivity, internet access, literacy, or the lack of it, disabilities that would largely affect the successful implementation of a biometric ID system. And of course, it did not pan out very well. Now, no future release should ever come at a cost of a human life. Now, I want to give a little uh, personal account of um, like where am I in my career and how, uh, what are the kind of companies that I've worked for in the past. So this is my sixth year working as a product designer and I have not always been working at places, uh, um, places that support open source methods of design or development. How I designed before? Mostly educated guesses, self-informed assumptions. It feels odd to speak these words um, today, but I have to tell you the truth. Now, were the concepts that I designed successful? Did they add any value for our users? I have no idea. I actually have no idea. I mean, nobody told me about it, and there were no means that I could myself go and find out about it. Now, every organization has a limitation of time and money. The success metric we followed was response to the advertisements that were released for our concepts. And with that project was usually completed. No follow-ups whatsoever, at least not on the projects that I was involved in. Now, sounds surreal to my own ears so many years down the line, but that's how we shipped. Did we speak to our users? Yes, we did. Now, research participants that we recruited for our studies uh, were through a third party agency. And I um, clearly remember that there wasn't a single instance when a participant didn't check their watch in the course of the user interview. It wasn't like we didn't know that the person might be making things up to share with us, just that we didn't care enough. So the user in the user experience was missing, like to a great extent, and how I work now. So I was looking to make a big shift in my work environment, uh, given uh, what I just shared with you. So my search began to look for an organization that kind of stands for everything that my then employer didn't. That's how I landed a job where I got a chance to work with an open source community. 
what was different? I suddenly had access to real users, eager to provide their inputs, and even to contribute to the direction of the product. I didn't even have to go and uh, put a lot of effort in recruiting, I and mean, people approached me. The participation was honest, and I was suddenly able to gauge the impact of the work I was doing. The sudden emergence of real users in the user experience process wasn't easy on me first, but very soon I learned to make the most out of it, and there was, of course, no looking back from there. Now, this changed everything for me as a designer. I made possible, uh, it made possible and even uh, convenient for me to have access to data that mattered, that communicates the right story, that ensures that I don't waste my or anybody else's time in working on something that doesn't provide value to our users. The feedback was more than immediate and honest, and that made me, that made me an honest designer, to be, uh, like, to be frank. I could no longer wear a mask of perfection. I had to embrace my imperfections, my shortcomings, and then began my journey of designing with the community. I became a more accountable and responsible designer. I understood the value of engaging with uh, people and together creating something that benefits everyone. And this is an instant, uh, an instance of uh, when I had to recently roll back a feature that I had uh, like put enough effort on along with my team. And I had to put it across a very honest note that even though these were my assumptions and I, in my knowledge, I had even uh, validated my findings or hypothesis, it did not work out because it just didn't. And I got clear feedback from the users directly right after it was uh, like put out there. And this is the kind of experience that was totally missing from my life before. Is it always a bed of roses? No, not at all. I get called out in the open for any mistakes I do. I even get tagged on Twitter quite often for that. So yeah, it's not a bed of roses. But there's always a room for a healthy discussion. And the ones, the kind of discussions that expose possibilities that as a lone designer, I would never be able to think of. So I'm very thankful for the setup that I now work with, the community that I work with, the people who I collaborate with, who are not even sometimes my team members. But is open source always the answer? The log4j incident from a few months back would say otherwise. So open source software is free, as in free speech, not free beer, open to be audited by the public, accessible to all. And these things make these softwares irresistible to big organizations. But some projects definitely have a wider visibility than others. While most people, uh, while most popular open source projects have thousands of contributors. Some are only managed by a handful of people and sometimes maybe just a single person. Now these projects may not have an official designer participating and that does not mean they're not serving experience. Um, they're still very much doing that. Now, just a few months back, uh, we all would have, I mean, the ones especially who's all, who are active on Twitter would have come across this uh, incident that a severe bug was found in the popular open source Apache logging library, Log4j. The program, which is used by just about everybody, led to widespread panic throughout the industry. And as companies just like scrambled to put patches in the systems and products that relied upon that, upon that technology uh, for success. Now the bug in question exposed more than security vulnerability. In this case, it exposed the ignorance of big tech and the lack of responsibility we collectively show towards open source projects. Many organizations and users do not acknowledge the responsibility they have towards the technology they used often for their projects. It is actually up to us if we want to participate and together craft an experience that, that would be beneficial for all or if we should prepare ourselves for more such major incidents in the future. Now with that, I want to stop recording. Uh, I mean, I want to stop sharing, not recording. Um, and 
the last message that I want to put forward is uh, exercising caution when using a new product or technology has developed in me as an um, occupational hazard. But that's not how things should be. Things should be transparent. Things should be uh, clear enough for uh, others to take a peep into the decision-making process to see how things were decided for them. And uh, that's the kind of future we should be aiming for. And that's all I had to share today with all of you. Thank you so much. Do we take questions, Katie? Or yeah, if we, we got a little time, so uh, if you're if you're game, then we can we can see. Um, uh, I just wanted to say that Randall Monroe's work, uh, both XKCD and uh, and his books, are a big favorite in my house. So that was <laughs> very fun, um, and and have have had many conversations about some of those underlying vulnerabilities. So uh, that's exciting. Um, so yeah, uh, friends in the audience, please. What what questions do we have? Yeah, thank you so much. That was fun. Um, could you talk I, and I uh, about some of your favorite open source projects, like either things that you worked on or things that you enjoy? Um, I'm cheating a little bit because I have a presentation later on non evergreen open source projects. So I, will... sure. <laughs> I may steal your content. Yeah. Uh, so one of the open source projects that I am most active on besides GitLab, of course, is um, it's PenPot. It's a tool for designers to create uh, prototypes. And even though um, I mean, for my work, I usually use a proprietary uh, tool, which is available. But for my personal projects, I thought about it a lot. Like, should I go for maybe I should buy a personal license? And uh, and that's how I should be creating uh, my uh, freelance um, artifacts. But then I bumped into uh, this particular tool, PenPod. It was open source. And while working on that, like, so with the designers, it's a problem. Like you always see the scope for improvement, no matter what you're using, even if you're drinking water with, from a glass. Uh, and just like I see some scope to for improvements in the proprietary softwares, I saw that here, and it struck me like, what if I go to the repository and you know open these issues? So I started creating issues, and the team uh, for that particular product they started to engage more with me uh, on Twitter on the issues. And those things, they actually started to get implemented. And it was such a kick. I mean, I don't think I would now be moving to any proprietary tool for my personal work, because it's so interesting. Like, you can totally contribute to the direction of that particular product that you were using for your own work. And um, well, that's for uh, the tools that I use as a designer. But there are certain projects, such as uh, Kubernetes, which I just admire from a distance. I'm not a big coder myself, so definitely I don't have much to contribute there. Um, but I, I seriously admire how they have structured the whole uh, process of moderation and you know, maintainership, like how much thought they have given to it, uh, how they have structured uh, the different steps that would go uh, starting from how a person can become a part of uh, the project, and who qualifies to become a moderator, maintainer, and how this whole uh, process of merging a change, which has been um, added by a project member, goes through like all the whole vouching process. It's it's just amazing. I mean, I, I actually spent a couple of hours just reading through their documentation and admiring it. <laughs> Well, we have many we have many sessions in the next couple of days on on yeah. the processes that that we use and and how they could be better and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah we, we definitely get that. And looking um, at sorry. Oh, I was gonna I was gonna read the audience question here, so it's in the recording. Okay. Um, how would you advise a small development team uh, in incorporating good design into our regular development practices? 
And is this team, uh, does it include or not include a designer? If I could get that little That's detail. Um, I will let Chris Sharp weigh in on whether or not his team includes a designer. Um, okay. but, and he said there's not a designer per se. I would say that in my experience with Evergreen, we have more programmers than designers. Okay. Um, but many of, yeah, many people also kind of dabble in, in both, so. Right. So I think one way of doing this can be uh, like when things work out for you, like if you implement certain patterns, which kind of uh, get really good reactions, very good feedback. And if you see things working very well for you, document them. And once they're documented, they would be there for everybody to reference. And uh, since there's no designer, I mean, as long as there's no designer on the team, what you can do to still get some solicitation from uh, designers outside the organization is uh, when you'll have an open uh, documentation, a public documentation, you can take it to Twitter. Sorry, I'm uttering Twitter a lot because I spend <laughs> a lot of time there, but it really helps. So I very often solicit feedback on Twitter uh, from other developers and people do participate. And people are looking for an opportunity to participate. They just have to be given this assurance that it's a safe space and uh, like they're valued. They would very happily come and have a conversation with you. Um, yeah, that's one way of doing that. And you, you just talked about one way of doing this um, to regularly get feedback from users. So one way is to take to Twitter or other social media uh, platforms and either I would imagine you could ask directly about a particular thing or, you know, try to uh, start a more general conversation. Yeah, so um, when I work on any feature in GitLab, all the issues are open. They are open for public. Yes. So sometimes what we do is we create these uh, discussion issues and we structure them very well. Like I would start those questions as different threads to solicit like what exactly are we looking for, uh, lo looking the feedback for. So the conversation doesn't get very uh, spread out and it stays within a context. And that's very helpful if you create something of that sort and then just ask people like in their free time, whenever they would want and want to come by and drop a comment or drop something for you. So that's the easier way of doing it. Otherwise, yeah, recruiting through Twitter, um, I mean, it depends, right? Like where do your users yeah. spend most of their time in? Um, so you would know better like <laughs> about that. I, I don't think I would be giving wrong uh, advice around that. Well, I, but I think that those kind of how you structure the conversation, you know, regardless of, of the, the platform on which it's happening, um, you know, finding ways to ask the, the right questions. Um, as librarians, we know that that uh, when a patron comes up to the desk, the first thing they ask you is not usually the thing that they actually want answered. So, so figuring out how to get down into that is is definitely is very important. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I exciting. see one question here. Uh, in what way do you regularly get feedback from your end users? So the issue that I mentioned is just one way. Uh, but since we are a big organization, we have many different channels through which we recruit and speak with our users. We do it very frequently. So on an average, I think uh, I would be conducting at least one research exercise every month or maybe two sometimes. And I speak with about eight to 10 uh, participants uh, for one single research initiative. So uh, those are the two major ways that I engage with our community. Otherwise, uh, most times I don't even have to go and get feedback. People just come and give feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a sense for, you know, one of the things you mentioned was creating that environment where the user feels valued and listened to? How are some of the ways that you do that in your interactions with users? Sure. So, um, I mean, one thing that I've seen that participants really appreciate is a quick turnaround. I mean, you can't just leave them hanging for a long time and then uh, come back when things are not as relevant and then respond to the query. So I make it a point that whenever I get tagged, I reach out to uh, the concerned person in as soon as I could, as soon as my schedule allows me. 
and uh, like try to like if the suggestions are in words, I try to manifest those into visuals. Like I try to make the picture more clear and mm -hmm. understand if that's a way that we can take or is there a reason we cannot go that way. So like providing very uh, honest reasons for everything uh, that you're taking from that suggestion and that you're not taking from that suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Okay, more audience questions, anybody? Uh, and if anyone does uh, prefer to ask the question uh, verbally, you can request uh, audio and video permissions and we can uh, can let you unmute if anyone would rather uh, join in that way. To, typing in the chat is not always the best way to uh, to ask a question. And I see that um, Debbie, uh, I think it was someone linked Penpot. Um, if anyone wants to check that out, yes, it was Debbie. Thank you. So yeah, if anyone wants to wants to check out that that app, I'm definitely gonna. Okay, with respect to design, if your users are giving you feedback in one direction and you communicate this to your superiors, they don't agree with, the, with that direction and the feedback provided. What are some tips on reconciling those different views? Um, so how we work, we don't necessarily have to take things to our superiors uh, as such. But um, like as a team, we communicate very openly. Like we don't do like we uh, huddle together in a Zoom call and get back to the issue. That almost never happens. And whatever discussion we have, we have it right there on the issue so that there's a transparency, there is a context and nothing gets lost. And we always pro try to provide as clear uh, reasoning for our thoughts as possible. And I think one thing that really makes it easy for me um, to communicate in that way is uh, the values that GitLab has in place. So this is the first time uh, I worked with something of that sort, but that has really helped me in uh, like following some practices that makes everybody feel safe, everybody uh, heard, everybody included, and uh, to have enough transparency in whatever we do. Mm -hmm. So because we practice it so often in almost everything we do, we kind of have imbibed it and we like adhere to that. Yeah, yeah the way that that company culture sets itself up yeah. and affects everything that you do is that's really important. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, and thank you for linking too, so we can yeah. we can see those. And to your point, Katie, like if one person is following these practices and the rest of the team is not, I don't think anything uh, would move ahead. So this has to be adopted by the whole team and not just one person. Yep, absolutely. And, and I think from uh, that, that has to be coming from management as well, right? Like yes. whatever your org structure is, that has to be pervading all the all the levels of it, or it's it's not going to be everyone. And um, as the leader of a consortium, I try my best. <laughs> Um, but it's it's uh it's it's not something you ever finish, right? Like that's a, a yeah, it's an ongoing process. That's true. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, we don't have our next round of sessions until uh, one thirty, so I'm going to give people a couple more minutes to see if they need uh, if they want to ask anything else in chat while we have your expertise available to us. Yes. Gina, are there any other uh, housekeeping things we need to take care of uh, before we move on? Uh, no, I was going to just mention what was coming up in the schedule, uh, but you, we have a little bit of time, so I could probably do that in about 15 minutes. <laughs> well, or if you want to do that while we wait to see if people have more questions or yeah, if yeah. you have questions. We, uh, we, we, can, we, we got some time to ask some questions. Yeah. Uh, I will say that there was like kind of a nefarious... Um, purpose uh, to like user experience, I think is one thing, especially that this community is very interested in. So yeah. um, uh, having the theme and also, you know, you to come in and talk about this is a very uh, much, uh, you know, 
big necessity that we we need to think about too as a community. So uh, putting a lot of things to thought here. So uh, please, if you have any like type of like user experience questions or design, uh, now's a really great time to ask them. Yeah, also <laughs> our, our community is a big fan of of GitLab um, and <laughs> as a company and uh, many, many uh, individuals and many organizations uh, use use Git for their repositories. So we, we appreciate the work that you do over there. Um, it's uh, it's definitely something that that we've adopted. And uh, my my spouse is an engineer and maintains an open source platform, and he is also a fan. Oh, so, um, that's so it's, a, it's exciting for us to have that have that connection. I, I will say too that uh, I had so many opportunities to plug the conference and this talk in particular um, because I've been in many meetings recently, like uh, the most recent meeting of the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, where we're talking about um, a lot of stuff that we talk about is the sort of the mechanics of how things work together and that's mm -hmm. important but we need to consider the staff experience and how the how frontline staff interact with the software and then also the patron experience so right. you know for us in libraries that end goal is for the community to use our product uh and so like taking those steps further out is is something that's a big part of our conversations right now and i think you know we saw a lot of questions about getting feedback for us we have it's we we try very hard to get staff feedback and we have good access to staff but then going that next step and getting the true end user feedback um is is something that that many of us are are trying to you know, make sure that we're doing well. So that's that's been exciting to hear about some ways to do that and some ways to think about that. Good points. Okay. Well, it's a couple of minutes after one. So I will say thank you so much, Vitika, for joining us today. I know we've all really enjoyed it. Um, and then Gina, if you want to go ahead and uh, talk about what's coming up at 1.30. All right. Well, again, thank you, Vidika. This is uh, really uh, great to have you here today. Uh, so today we have, again, a, a lot of things are going to be on two tracks, um, though we do have lightning talks coming up at 3 p.m. I will put a link in the chat for the sign up. Uh, the new thing that we're doing this year is offering half hour sessions as well, uh, just in case people needed to have shorter time to talk about the presentation. So for track one, we have uh, two presentations going on within the hour coming up at 1.30 to 2. We have ideas with Launchpad um, and 2 to 2.30 is going to be spicing up Evergreen with Chili Pack. And coming up at 1.30 to 2.30 for the hour is a systems admin interest group on track two. So again, we have the full schedule and program details in our website. If you go to, uh, I think it's reception, uh, that's where you'd be able to find that. Oh, I was muted. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> All right, no problem. All right, we'll see everybody at 1.30.